this third service, I want to appreciate God and his able servant, the state pastor in absentia, for the privilege. Praise the Lord. God's servant is not with us in the service today in the physical, but he is with us in the spirit. Praise the Lord. He had to travel on official assignment to one of our stations. Praise God. And just like he prayed for us this morning, expect strange testimonies from this service. In the mighty name of Jesus. We have been looking at understanding the cost and cure of ungodliness. This is part four and the final in our Sunday series. Understanding the cost and cure of ungodliness. We have been trying to find out why we need to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Why must we exercise ourselves unto godliness? Why this demand on us to be godly? I'd like you to know that each time God places a demand on your life, he is placing that demand because he is thinking of your good. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, number two, and to love him, number three, and then that love should motivate you to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Verse 13. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I commanded this day for thy good. For whose good? For my good. If I keep the commandments, if I walk in all his ways, if I love him with all my heart, and I serve him, it's all for my good. Amen. If you have this understanding, you won't feel as though God is trying to deprive you of anything by placing a demand on you to be godly. Say with me, Loving God and serving God and obeying God is all for my good. Hallelujah. Now we must exercise ourselves unto godliness because among other things, ungodliness, number one, blocks access to supernatural breakthroughs. It blocks access to supernatural breakthroughs. Ungodliness will keep you stagnated and frustrated in life. And you don't want that. Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 14 to 19. Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 14 to 19. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. He said, but the path of the just is as the shining light, that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. For the just, you enjoy supernatural breakthroughs, endless progress, unstoppable progress. 
He said the path of the just has a shining light. But in verse 19, he said, but the wicked, he said his way is like darkness. So, breakdowns characterize the life of the wicked. They know not at what they stumble. That means their progress in life is stiffly resisted. Ungodliness blocks access to supernatural breakthroughs. In Isaiah 60 from verse 1 to 3, the Bible says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. He said, But gross darkness shall be upon the people. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. He said, But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And then the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. This season, I see multitudes following you to serve your God. Yeah. By reason of the glory of God, they shall see upon your life. They will follow you to serve your God. Yeah. He said, Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. That is your Lord when you embrace godliness. Why exercise ourselves unto godliness? Number two, ungodliness destroys destiny. Ungodliness destroys destiny. It destroyed the destiny of Esau. In Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 14 to 17. And what happened to him is supposed to be for our example. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently. Verse 13. Or rather verse 15. Looking diligently. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you. And thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. It was too late. He sold off his birthright because he could not tame his appetite. He could not deal with ungodliness in his life. The Bible says, none of us should be like him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just for one plate of pottage, one plate of red pottage, he sold out his destiny. Sold out his destiny. Your destiny shall not be destroyed. I said your destiny shall not be destroyed. In the precious name of Jesus. You must keep giving God the first place in your life. Always celebrating his acts in your life. Never taking his glory. Never arguing with his demands upon your life. And that way your destiny shall be preserved. Psalm 28 verse 5 says... Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the oppression of his hands, he said he shall destroy them and not build them up. That shall not be your experience. That shall not be your portion in Jesus' name. When you keep regarding God, regarding the oppression of his hand in your life, it preserves your life, it preserves your destiny. But when you don't do that, he said, Destruction is imminent. Number three. Why must we exercise ourselves unto godliness? Ungodliness engenders untimely death. It engenders untimely death. James chapter 1 from verse 13 to 15. Sin at the end of the day will lead to destruction. You say, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, the Bible says, it bringeth forth death. That is the ultimate purpose of sin. To bring death at the end of the day. It goes through a process from one stage to the other. And at the end of the day, the final product is death. And so because I don't want to die before my time, I don't toy with sin. If you don't want to die before your time, don't toy with sin. Don't toy with sin. Sin is a sinker. Sin is a destroyer. It has a sweet beginning, but always a very bitter end. If you can think of the end, you will avoid every temptation. You will avoid falling to every temptation. You won't die before your time. I said you will not die before your time. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus. And so godliness is God's prescription for the preservation of our lives and destinies. Hallelujah. The devil has no power against your life. If you follow that which is good, praise the Lord. In Isaiah 54 verse 14, the Bible says, In righteousness you shall be established. And when you are established in righteousness, it said you shall be far from oppression. You will be far from terror because you will not fear. It shall not come near you. Hallelujah. Just get established in righteousness. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. He said, And who is he that can harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Hallelujah. So your choice for godliness makes you unharmable. It makes you indestructible by the enemy. And therefore, I regard godliness as the most reliable security strategy for a child of God. Praise the Lord. Your choice for godliness secures your life. It, it guarantees divine immunity against the attacks of the enemy against your life. Hallelujah. You saw how godliness preserved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. The fire had no power over them because of their choice for godliness. You saw how godliness preserved Daniel in the den of the lions. The lions had no power over him to destroy him because of his choice for godliness. And therefore, godliness is your most reliable security strategy as a child of God. Hallelujah. Number four, we exercise ourselves unto godliness because ungodliness blocks access to eternity with Christ. It blocks access to eternity with Christ. In Matthew chapter 7, from verse 21 to 23, Jesus speaking. In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? 
And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity. That will not be our portion. Amen. I said that will not be our portion. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. What you do with God's commandments will determine whether you will make heaven or not. It's not calling him Lord, Lord. Say, not those who call me Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of my Father. So, it doesn't matter if you sleep in the church. If you don't do the will of the Father, if you don't obey the word of God that you are hearing, and allow it to guide your steps in life, you may not make it to heaven, but you will make it in the name of Jesus. Because I believe you can't hear all of these teachings on godliness and still choose, I mean, on godliness and still choose ungodliness. Hallelujah. You won't miss heaven. I say you shall not miss heaven. You shall not miss heaven. Let me prophesy to yourself I shall not miss heaven. I shall not miss heaven. I tell you. That is the ultimate. That is the ultimate. Even if godliness will not, you know, bring any good thing to you in this life, and you can make heaven, and you make heaven at the end of the day, I tell you, you have not lost anything. Praise God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If you are only following Jesus for the good things of this life, he said you are of all men most miserable. See, the, people, the, the reason many are careless with their lives is because they don't have heaven in view. They don't have heaven in view. They think everything will end here. And so, so much, you know, crazy pursuit of material things at the expense of their relationship with God. In the name of Jesus, as you exercise yourself unto godliness, the profits in this life, you will not miss it. The prophets in the life to come, you will not miss it. Amen. That's what 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 says. Bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. It has promised for this life and for the life which is to come. Therefore, in the mighty name of Jesus, the prophets for this life shall not elude you. Amen. The prophets in the life to come that is paradise and eternity with Christ. It shall not elude you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. To deal with ungodliness, what must we do? Number one, we must engage in purging and purifying ourselves. We must engage in purging and purifying ourselves. Don't see sin as insurmountable. You have all it takes to say no to every temptation to sin. Romans chapter 6, from verse 1 to 6. Romans 6, from verse 1 to 6. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Say with me, God forbid. He said, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we are baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. 
that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. The day you surrendered your life to Jesus, what you are saying is, Jesus, I throw away my old life. Live your new life through me. And if you allow him to live his life in you, there is no way you can be comfortable with sin. Hallelujah. From verse 11 of that Romans 6 to verse 14. He said, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let it reign. Don't give it prominence. That you should obey it in the loss thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Say with me, sin shall not have dominion over me. Sin shall not have dominion over me. Sin shall not have dominion over me. By the grace of God that is being released upon you via his word this morning, whatever sin was dominating your life before, from now on you begin to dominate that sin. You begin to dominate that sin. In the precious name of Jesus. It doesn't matter for how long you have been there. Living under the dominion of that sin. If you begin to exercise yourself. In the newness of life that Jesus has imparted you with. You will see yourself as being dead to that sin. You look at it face to face and say, I refuse to commit you. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. We must engage in purging and purifying ourselves. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. James 4, 7 and 8. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? He will flee from you. And in verse 8, he said, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Praise the Lord. Number two, we must strive to cast off every unwanted habit by engaging the name of Jesus in warfare. Cast off every unwanted habit. You have the God-given power to use the name of Jesus to cast out any devil. Mark 16, 17. This son shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. So use the power in the name and cast out every spirit behind that sinful habit. Hallelujah. You must do that consciously. You must do that consciously. The name of Jesus, the Bible says, is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Proverbs 18 verse 10. The righteous run it into it and they are saved. The righteous run it into it and they are saved. Hallelujah. And so, when that same partner calls you, confront him or her with the name of Jesus. Tell him or her, I am doing no more. In the name of Jesus, I cast out that spirit of immorality from you now. And that will be the end of the discussion. Praise the Lord. That will be the end of the discussion. Just throw the name of Jesus at that person. And the power to tempt you 
will be destroyed. Say, in his name, you cast out devils. You will cast out devils. Praise the Lord. If we will use the name to deal with sin, the way we are using the name to pray for miracle jobs, using the name to pray for business breakthrough, I tell you, you will find yourself cheaply overcoming every temptation that comes your way. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. You can cast off every unwanted habit. The same way habits of ungodliness are formed, you can also form habits of godliness. Practice makes perfect. So instead of practicing sin, begin to practice righteousness. Begin to practice righteousness. And very soon, it will become strange for you to engage in sin. Hallelujah. If you are given to lying, for instance, begin to practice telling the truth deliberately. And very soon, the lying spirit will leave you alone. You can cast off any unwanted habit by engaging the name of Jesus in warfare. And number three, we must strive to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. We must strive to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. Romans 8 and verse 13. You can mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, he says, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 16 and 17. If you don't want the flesh to dominate you, let the spirit dominate you. Very simple. This I say them, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the loss of the flesh. At every point of temptation, there are two voices you will be hearing. The voice of the Holy Spirit telling you, don't do it. The voice of the Holy Spirit giving you warnings about the consequences of what you want to do. And then the voice of the flesh calling on you. You are not the only one that is doing it now. Do it. Even if this is the last time. The blood of Jesus is there for you to plead and get for forgiveness. Just this once. The flesh and the spirit will always be contesting for your attention. Galatians 5 verse 17. They will always be contesting for your attention. He said, for the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And so, if you determine I will always be listening to the voice of the spirit. Before long, you will silence the voice of the flesh. Praise the Lord. If somebody is talking to you continuously and you don't respond to the person, will the person continue talking? You understand what I'm saying? If somebody is always talking, is talking to you, talking to you, and you don't respond, he will get tired of talking. In the same vein, when the flesh is crying out for attention, telling you, go and commit this sin, go and commit this sin, go and commit this sin, and you choose to listen to what the Spirit is saying, before long you will silence the voice of the flesh. It's as simple as like that. Before long you will silence the voice of the flesh. And then, you will deaden the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Sin shall not have dominion over you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. God has determined to restore all that you have lost to the enemy today. Whatever belongs to you and I in redemption that the enemy has stolen, today they shall be fully restored. I said they shall be fully restored in the mighty name of Jesus. In this revival season, God 
is restoring all that the enemy has stolen. Every move of the spirit is accompanied with waves of restoration. And that's what we see from Joel chapter 2 from verse 23 to 27. He's talking about the move of the spirit. When he's talking about the latter rain and the former rain, he's talking about the reign of the Holy Spirit. Each time the Holy Ghost is moving, restoration takes place. Glory to God. But see, you need to know what belongs to you. Otherwise, you may never know when it is stolen. What is it that belongs to us in redemption? Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12. These are the redemptive packages that Jesus procured for us with his precious blood on the cross of Calvary. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, to receive riches, to receive wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and blessing. Seven of them. Jesus procured all of these redemptive virtues for us with his precious blood. And if any one of them is missing, the devil has stolen it. Amen? He said in John 10 and verse 10, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So, he came to restore all that the enemy has stolen. Praise the Lord. In Psalm 34 verse 10, the Bible says, The young lions may do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Whatever good thing that salvation affords, that is missing in your life, today they shall be recovered from the hand of the enemy. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. The same God who restored double of all that Job lost to the enemy will restore double whatever you have lost to the enemy. Amen. Let me hear your believing, amen. amen. What are the covenant steps to our restoration? Number one, you must be born again. You must be born again. If you are not born again, you are likely to keep suffering again and again. Hallelujah. The life of sin is characterized by the destructions of the enemy. The devil's threefold mission of stealing, killing, and destroying will continue in your life if you are not born again. But when you are born again, you can cheaply overcome him and take back everything he has stolen. In 4 John 5 and verse 4, he said, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Praise the Lord. Number two, you must fully return back to God. You must fully return back to God. Job 22 and verse 23. You must fully, fully return back to God. He said, if thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. If you return back to him, he said, you will be built up. You will be built up. Just like the prodigal son in Luke 15, from verse 18 to 25. He took off on a prodigal journey. Wasted all his substance. Lost everything to sin. Until he came to himself and said, I will arise and go back to my father. And the father welcomed him with open arms. It doesn't matter how far you have gone. The day your mind is made up to return, God will receive you. And I see that day being today for somebody. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. You must fully return back to God. 
God will never say, my son, you have gone too far. Please keep going. No. The moment you make up your mind, I am returning back to God. His arms will be wide open to receive you. Today shall be a return day for somebody. In the precious name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus. One of the ways also we return back to him is in our covenant practice. In Malachi chapter 3 from verse 7 to 10. If you have been careless with your tithing, make up your mind to return back to him in tithes and in offerings. And then you begin to enjoy your open heavens again. You begin to rebuke the devourer again for your sake. Praise the Lord. Number three, you must pray for your desired recovery. Very shortly, I'll be asking you to pray. You must pray for your desired recovery. Hezekiah's health was challenged to the point of death in Isaiah 38 from verse 1 to 5. And he turned his face to the wall and prayed endlessly. And God restored his health and gave him 15 more years. Praise the Lord. Jacob was left alone in Genesis 32 from verse 24 to 28. He wrestled all night with God in prayer. And at the end of the day, he secured a change of name. God will give you a new name today. I say God will give you a new name today. In the name of Jesus. Jabez prayed in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 verses 9 and 10. And his honor was restored. Sorrow was terminated in his life. Because he cried unto God for his restoration. Whatever you request of him today, God will release it to you in the name of Jesus. And number four, you must recognize the prophet sent to you as an agent of restoration. You must recognize the prophet sent to you as an agent of restoration. Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 and 41. You must recognize the prophet sent to you as an agent of restoration. Say, he that received you, received me, and he that received me, received him that sent me. He say, whosoever receives a prophet, verse 41, in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Shall receive a prophet's reward. So everyone sent by God to speak his counsel into your life, believe in them, and your restoration shall be full. In the precious name of Jesus. First Samuel chapter 30. From verse 6 to 12. He lost everything to the enemy. He went to God. In prayers of inquiry in verse 8. And God said. Pursue the enemy. Overtake the enemy. And recover all. Are you ready to pursue? Rise up to your feet. Rise up to your feet. In the mighty name of Jesus. You know what you have lost to the enemy. Lift up your voice right now and call upon the God of restoration to recover all that the enemy has stolen from you. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Have you lost your health? You will recover it now. Have you lost a job? You will recover it now. Have you lost a business opportunity? There shall be double restoration for you. Have you lost any profit in business? There shall be double restoration for you. Call upon your God now. Call upon the God of restoration. Is it your marriage the enemy is trying to steal? There shall be restoration for you. Restoration of your marital destiny. God, the God of restoration. He said he will restore all the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar have eaten. Today marks the end of every shame and reproach. He said, and my people shall never be ashamed. 
le kapando reda koshitalia zeko pande ragadi akata malande jabra kitato zakoria kitale mando robosha ziko parikate lani agadanga rakata koteke teke baraka tizakatia recover all recover all recover all pursue overtake and recover all pursue overtake and recover all pursue overtake and recover all Oh, Zia Kente Bariana Lorobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobobob